Hello, people, again. Uh, today, it won't be as fast-paced as yesterday, all right? Today will be slight, somewhat slow-paced. And uh, many of the things I'll be mentioning today are things that many of you have raised and highlighted over, say, the past day and a half. But, uh, and there are many stories across the globe. I'd like to share some stories here, all right? And uh, many of which relate to what you people are doing or you're planning to do, all right? Like I said, you don't have to wait, just do it. So, I'm gonna talk about three different stories, all right? First is talking about the fish, fish conservation and the dolphin conservation in Sipandon, all right? That's in the southern bit of the Mekong River in Laos. Then uh, I'm talking about, uh, I'll be talking about the uh, CBT slash CBET. This is a community-based ecotourism and tourism in the northern part of Thailand, in Chiang Mai. And the next one, the last one will be the village conservation monitoring units. There are some differences here. Right, three different stories, different scenarios, similar community goals, varying approaches, all community-centered, and similar conservation outcomes. All right, so you don't have to go by one model. All right, first I'm gonna talk about the Sipandon. All right, that's the Irrawaddy Dolphin. And that's the Mekong River. The Mekong River can range from time to time, so you have flooded forests also, not as uh, flooded as maybe uh, South America. Now, a bit of background on Sipandon. Sipandon, which means 4,000 islands. But the last time I counted was 4,002. All right, don't believe me. Okay, so it's uh, adjoining both Laos and Cambodia at the Mekong River, and this Kong district, or this, this, this area is full of rapids, uh, deep pools, and so on, all right? So down here, here. All right, <clears throat> bit more on the background. We've got a, num a few hundred species already identified from that area, uh, 200 plus to be exact, and so out of which 80% uh, have commercial value. And of course, if you look at the whole Mekong River, uh, more, I would say more than 1,200 species have been recognized. And uh, I want you to focus on the amount of money generated from the fishery. Then, problems started because overconsumption, I wouldn't say overconsumption, but overharvest, right? Driven by income, whether from the growing population itself and from the outside population, all right? So, and then there were other issues like changing, the modifying the ecosystems. Some of the human modified ecosystem were not friendly to the ecosystem itself, all right? We're talking about small scale irrigation or farming to large scale hydroelectric dams, which a number more are coming up. So one of the things that is pretty unique about the area besides the landscape, besides the fishery, is the presence of the Irrawaddy dolphin, critically endangered dolphin, all right? And over time, either as bycatch or accidental catch or intentional catch, many dolphins have died in the process, ranging from something simple, simple mechanism in the past to more modern mechanism, nets using bombs and whatnot. Don't forget there are a lot of bombs in the area, remnants from Uncle Sam during the American uh, Indochina War. All right, a bit more on the history. Now, the villages themselves, before all this conservation started, there was already areas which they identified, could be along the stream or rivers, which literally translate means fish conservation zone. They already have it, right? But maybe over time, because of uh, lack of strength within the community itself and outside pressure, they've started losing all this respect for the past tradition. So now, here we have the local ecological knowledge, knowing where the fish is located, what their traditional rules and regulations are, or taboos are regarding the fish conservation zone, and we're using science. Again, I would like to give credit where credit goes. This guy, Ian Baird, he's now, he's a Canadian, he's a professor in the uh, US, with only 3,000 US dollars, have achieved what mega projects have not, mega conservation projects have not been able to achieve. We have, we have had projects ranging from 4 million and above euros and dollars, can't be compared to his achievement, I would say. I give credit to him. So what he has done is that 
uh, he spent time with the community, learn that is all ears and less mouth. Learn, listen and learn about their fish conservation zone, about their harvest and so on and so on, so their social economic issues. So these communities there have a problem. They have limited lands. They cannot grow rice. They have limited area to grow rice and rice is very staple. But they have fish, but the fish is declining. So what he did was brought back the local ecological knowledge, combined it with science and developed simple rules and regulations. Who enforces them? The community themselves. Why? We'll talk about it in a while. And then this later on was followed up by the WWF Sipandon project, a bigger project. Typical of major NGOs, they only come in when everything is so sexy and so nice and take over from the small people. All right? I'm being rude here. <laughs> okay. Now, what drives food insecurity? Right? Because of overcatch, there's less fish. Overcatch and outside pressure, there's less fish now and no, no place to go rice. So food insecurity, poverty. So this forced them to, to communicate. And then we combine the local ecological knowledge. And uh, again, innovation. So simple, creative ideas that you put into action. Plus leadership, here would be leadership from Ian Baird himself, plus the village uh, leaders, all right? So when that was combined, they started demarketing areas. Areas where no fishing is allowed. Areas where fishing is allowed, but we're talking about when can you fish, how you can fish, who you can fish. Ah, this is important. So when you say you give them the ownership. So the communities before had no ownership. It was tragedy of commons. They had ownership maybe 100 years ago. Then they lost the ownership because of modernization. Now they've taken own ownership again. So they were the one who enforced their own rules. Again, they police among themselves, against themselves, and against outsiders. Within a short period, fish supply came back. All right? Fish supply came back, and this one came. So we're talking about this. So you don't have to focus on dolphin to save the dolphin, but you can focus on other things to save the dolphin. Right? So be innovative. So the dolphin got saved. Increased fish supply led to food security, improved incomes. And two things I would like to mention, which probably was mentioned several times today and yesterday, empowerment and pride. It's not always money. We stay in our offices in big cities, think that income generation alone is very important for the communities. No, maybe something else. Each community have their own needs. And maybe my needs would be Hey, I want a voice, empowerment. Hey, I want a pride. Hey, I want my culture to be preserved. That are strong driving forces. So because of that, it went back to the ecosystem protection and conservation, which went back to fish supply and goes on. in a nice cycle. All right, now I'm going to talk about another area. Again, this is not in a protected area. Of course, when we talk about Sipandon, they have their rules and uh, laws regarding the fishery and so on, but it's all community-led. Here is interesting. It's nowhere near, okay, no, say nowhere. It's not within a protected area, right? I would, again, I will talk about leadership. This man here, he's the, was the village head man, now he's the village elder. He's a retired civil servant, right, who has taken upon himself to lead the community. So we're talking again, partially top-down, but acceptance by the community. Who has taken this place to an international level? Why do I say international? Because uh, students, uh, academicians are coming from different parts of the world to visit this village to study their system. All right? This illustration sh shows, unfortunately the light is a bit too strong, shows the, how intact the nature is. And these are my students. Who are my students? I've got Bhutanese students here, I've got Nepali, uh, French, one American, and one Taiwanese, right? And this is common for people not only to bring students to study the area, to do a site visit, but also communities from other areas are making site visits to this place. So the community has now become trainers itself. The waterfall, which is very important 
providing water resource to the valley. And this is just one hour from Chiang Mai. When I say one hour, we're talking about 60 kilometers only, but winding road. Right? Now, that's the village. Where can you find village nestled in the forest with plenty of water? Cool. Chiang Mai during summer is horrible, it's hot. But go up here any time of the year, it's cooling. All right? So a bit of background here. So a small village across the valley, because it's a steep left, uh, valley. There are two national parks there, Meta Krai and Cheson, which is down here. And uh, now the community, the, the enterprise, the, the tourism enterprise, wholly owned by the community, although it, was, it received initial assistance from an NGO. But again, I would say that it was due to the leadership of that uh, village elder who has been invited to, to give talks not only in Thailand but also abroad with, through a translator. Now, besides that, they have something else that's unique. They generate their own electricity from a micro hydro, a mini hydro, micro is smaller. So mini hydro without impact on the environment. They channel some of the water. They, di they don't divert. They don't block. They don't divert. But channel some of the water where they generate enough electricity for their village because electricity could not reach their village in the past. So they decided to generate. And that was at the idea of the, His Majesty the King when he visited the place a long time ago. Say, hey, you got the resource. Why don't you do that? So they generated electricity. It was good enough, more than good enough for the community they started selling the electricity. So villagers pay very cheaply for the electricity. Extra electricity, they uh, link it to the main grid and sell it to the provincial Ele electricity authority. And the provincial e electric authority wanted to manage, help them manage. They said no, because they don't trust. And they, they have a good reason for not trusting. Prior to tourism, they also generate income from coffee, Shade coffee, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, right? And also what they call as miang tea. Miang tea is a chewing tea, right? The tea that is fermented is something traditional, but it doesn't have much market today because culture has changed. Young people don't take them anymore. All right, here's the mini hydro. That's as large as it gets. Very small. About maybe one-sixth of this room. Very tiny. All right, those are old machines, they're on display. Now I'm going to talk about the shade coffee. That's the coffee plantation. Shade coffee requires shade. So the forest is intact. The villagers have every reason to protect the forest because the forest helped them generate income. So shade coffee, and not only shade coffee, beekeeping. Beekeeping in nature, and you all know bees play an important role in the ecosystem. All right? So... That's the coffee here. Today, they've taken it to a step further, add value to their coffee. Before, they were just selling the coffee. Later on, roasting the coffee and selling the coffee. Now, they uh, roast it to a level that they have their own brand. Somebody was mentioning today, this morning, I went to a presentation on clustering. Innovation. Adding value to the product. I could sell this for five, five uh, say, ringgit a kilo. Now I'm selling it for 20 ringgit a kilo. Starbucks are buying from them, by the way. But Starbucks, of course, mix up everything. They have their own formula. And charge you, what, 10, 12 ringgit a glass of coffee? All right. Now, again, the, besides the electricity, the, it, was, it developed because of the tourism and Ecotourism, CBT and CBET, depending on what packages you go for. It became a best practice. Many PhDs have resulted from that place. Many masters have resulted from that place, plus a lot of uh, uh, what you call this study tours. All right? And uh, now, they already have a committee. This is where the strength lies, the empowerment. They already have a committee, a uh, cooperative. It started from a cooperative that oversaw the hydropower, the electricity. They have a committee, and every villager is a member, All right? They have a committee, I mean, sorry, the cooperative, everyone is a member, and they have a committee, and the C, uh, community based tourism committee was taken from the cooperative, so they interlink, all right? So the CBT initially was, okay, we want to improve our community, because 
they still were a bit far because access road was not good. By the way, the road that was available since 2005 was from the own money, not the government money. So they have 12 months of access because of their own money. So now, as CBT developed, they add value to the product. So co from coffee to roasted coffee bean, grounded coffee bean, they even have coffee, coffee stands with espressos and all the machine and whatnot in the village. All right? The dried tea, the, the, sorry, the chewing tea have less value. So what do they do? They dry the tea and make them into little cushions from deodorizers to just cushion for your bags and whatnot. All right? Uh, some of the locals are now picking up English through their own uh, innovation again. All right? And then uh, some training. and They even have their own website. Now, these are villagers. I'm a villager. I cannot establish a website. What do I do? Get the university student from the local university, pay him a few hundred ringgit a month to do this, to just maintain the website. So, innovation. All right. So, here I want to emphasize on the conservation. Shade coffee and other agro agroforestry products relies on a good forest. Forest is protected and it provides income. The mini hydro relies on good water source. No forest, no water. Right? Simple as that. So cheaper electricity, additional income, is a source of pride. People come to see it. Only that sometimes. And what about the CBT and CBET? Now, you must have a place that showcase or give you that sense of harmony and ambience. People want to get away from the city, and it's only an hour away. So people may go there for half a day, but most people like to stay overnight. So again, it relies on a good ecosystem and good biodiversity. So poachers, traditional poachers, have turned into guides. They know the forest better. Right? They know the value of protecting the animals for their own community. So everything is about the community. So where does the success lie? Again, I would like to emphasize on leadership, community participation, empowerment. Well, there already exists a cooperative that helped it, and there was some initial NGO assistance. Now they stand alone. All right? This is one of the rare examples, and I think it would be very nice to get communities from here to do study tours there. It costs nothing. Now, to summarize what we saw just now, is that the, these are the drivers. You want additional income, this and so on. And initial NGO assistance led to community participation, which later on led to the two committees, all right, which one was derived from the cooperative. And uh, this led to the CBT, and the CBT slash CBET led again to this. And new products, new novel products, which again led into this. And it goes into a circle. This is what we call sustainability. Of course, if you want to know about the threats, there's a longer talk. They are also threatened by other issues, which they managed to overcome. All right, now I'm going to talk about in protected areas. This is in Laos. All right, VCMU is an acronym I gave in 1998 to a group which I started because I was tasked to establish a patrolling team. But I felt that that's not an effective use of resources. The patrolmen are already out there in the forest, enforcing. But why not convert them to become para-scientists, soft scientists? They're out there. Why not get them to collect more data, more than what we can do, right? So here we have a combination of co-patrolling team. All right? We did joint training. And it was good to have this joint training because you have the forestry staff who have, say, a college degree, a diploma. They're educated. You have the villagers who can barely read and write. These are ethnic minority. So the initial training was in the classroom. There was somewhat of a disparity. This group can learn faster. This group had difficulty learning. And we, of, we also had the border police, because this was a bordering province, uh, bordering protected area. We also had the mil district military, so combined. So we started getting the different agencies to work together. But in the field, the shift happened. The, the forestry guards, or uh, not say guards, the technicians relied on the villagers. The villagers had the local ecological knowledge. So here they shine out. In the end, they join hands because I have one skill, you have another skill. You, when you start realizing each other's skills and you need those skills to survive, 
because my training is very hard, to be honest. And uh, people do know me by a different title in Lao. They call me the cruel teacher, which I'm proud of. <laughs> All right. And for the villagers, they comprise three groups. One is the militia, because in Laos, they have village militia, Laos and Vietnam. Village militia, they have the modern weapons, and they are the hunters, those who can do maximum damage. The village peacekeepers, that's like village police, these are appointed. They get some training how to shoot. There, yeah, you're appointed. So they are the ones who are doing the biggest damage in terms of hunting. Convert them. Convert them to become conservationists, but it's not overnight. Something that people have been mentioning today and yesterday, building that relationship building that trust. In Asian culture, you overcome a lot of difficulties through relationship. All right? So, and the uh, third party from the villager will be the for village forestry volunteer. It's a, a socialist communist system that ha occurs in both Laos and Vietnam. All right. So a bit of background about this place, Nakai Nam Turn. I'm not going to read out everything, but it's straddled along the Anamite chain of mountain. Which is, which is the hottest hotspot. Why? Because there are a lot of niches there, ecological niches. So it's a spot for uh, very rich biodiversity, but mainly for endemic species. Species that if we, when I was in college, we said that we won't discover any more new large mammal. Birds, maybe. Insects, yes. But the last two decades, we found many large mammals, and we're still discovering. Frogs? Many species have come up from there because they're all secluded, isolated from each other. All right, these are some of the larger animals. All right, we're not talking about one or two villages. 31 villages inside the protected area and 93 around. That's not easy to manage. All right. So the ICDP project wanted to establish three pilot sites. And the conservation was a tiny component of the ICDP. ICDP. Oh, sorry, Integrated Conservation and Development Project, which many of us are skeptical about. But nevertheless, I'm going to focus on the village, uh, the community point of view. All right? So there, they practice Sweden cultivation, slash and burn. They do hunting. They collect uh, non-timber forest produce, and so on, unsustainably. Why? Because the protected area belongs to the government, not them. Now, think about this. We are trying to protect and say, you can't do this, you can't do that. This sounds like MC Hammer's song, you can't touch this. Right? I, but I rely on it. So what do I do? Get as much as I can. Today, now. But why do you do it? If I don't do it, somebody else will do it. My neighbor will do it. The guy from the next village will do it. So they use poison, they use bombs to catch fish. And they can take only maybe 10% of what they bomb and fish, uh, poison. So it's a loss, all right? And then, okay, today, the, because it's associated with the hydro project, so the hydro project is running it, and it's a failure. Not say hydro project is running it, they're providing one million US dollars per year, which is more than what the area need. But why is the failure? Again, human resources, but not at the village level, at the government level, all right? That's another topic altogether. Now. Most of the electricity gets sold to Thailand, but excess in Thailand, all the hydropower generated from Thailand, electricity generated from Thailand, the excess gets sold to Malaysia. And Malaysia in excess sold, sells to Singapore. It's part of the grid. All right? And Malaysia is investing in a few dams there also. So this project was started in 1998. One short project, I was involved, it was very good. Project ended, everything collapsed. But that's how the title came about, VCMU. All right. Then there was another project prior to the dam. That's a DUDCP. All right. So here, initially, it was tasked to establish patrolling teams in three pilot sites. By second year, it was successful that I requested the World Bank that I want to extend. So we, I got uh, two villages per zone. That area has three zones. All right. So. Now, in terms of uh, duties of the patrollers, one is patrolling, but then I included monitoring, monitoring wildlife, monitoring impacts, using simple technology. We had, didn't have smart those days. That was a bit less smart. But by the way, until now, the longest ever data for any protected area in Laos were collected by 
those villagers who can barely read or write. Don't ask them to collect everything, something. All right? So destroying snares and trap. When we talk about law enforcement, within the communities li living in and around, communities coming from elsewhere and transboundary poachers also. We had th those issues. Now, this was an extra. Establishing local rules and regulation. This was an extra. Yesterday I mentioned, you see, you do something, you see, you see hey, there's an opportunity. Try it. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. So I saw there was an opportunity. Right? Why not use my trainees, through the trainees, establish local rules and regulation, which was not difficult. I listened more. Find out about what they had in the past before the protected area rules and regulation. What traditional taboos, do's and don'ts, and then combine with my signs. And then we developed something, local, specific. Right? It was not tasked by the World Bank or the local the government. So, but important, somebody again mentioned earlier today was continuity. So you need to provide input. My input was three to six months, three to six months. But even three to six months was not enough. So I requested the World Bank, I said I needed, I need a, someone to be there all the time. And he rotated among the villagers because you, can, you come across new problems, new issues, new data. How did they compile? So he assisted. All right. I'm going to talk about success story, not into the nitty gritty of the, how it came about. That, those are VCU, VCMU members, villagers. That's a transboundary poacher. That's a marble cat and a golden cat bones. All right. They all turn into medicine, garu wood. But this is just one example. I have another example with no photograph. One of my team member, a villager, alone, with a gun, paired with a, a pair of binoculars which we issued, arrested a whole village. They were doing fish poisoning. A whole village. What did he do? He said he observed them for half an hour to see if anyone had any weapons. Then he went down with his uh, AKA, Chinese AKA. Right? He said without the binoculars, he couldn't. Why, what pushed him to do it? We'll talk about that. There must be something that pushes him to do it. All right? So, more on the success stories, this is what we found. Wildlife increase. Hunting and trapping reduce. Habitat disturbance reduce. All right? Based on simple data collection. And they've helped address many of these problems. Now, again, I put a star because this was after three months of working with one particular village, we said, hey, let's do something. And they were a bit worried about it. I said, let's try. If it doesn't work, fine. All right? So we established one set of rules and regulations for one village. It worked. It worked that it extended to the other villages within the same zone. But who pushed it? Not me. I just sat down with the first village. The other villages themselves got together with the first village, said, hey, let's establish these rules and regulations too. Can you advise us? But what pushed them again? I'll tell you in a while, all right? So the why is important. Always ask why. But yesterday we have a problem. Why we have the problem? Always get to the underlying reason. All right, so the VCMU was part of the ICDP. Another story. The driving force, right? Food insecurity. People, they have rise to it from three to six months a year. At other times, they eat corn mixed with cassava, tapioca, right? And they say that's poor man's food. They would not like to eat that. But these are the drivers that, fought, that led for the community to participate. So there was a need. We identified the need. There was a need. So we used the MCA, uh, VCMU to assist this. So through the VCMU, we developed the rules and regulation from the leg, from the culture, from the taboos, do's and don'ts. We started all these activities combined with our activities, and this led to food being available. I'll, talk, I'll tell you a short, story, short story. All right? This came out because of this. this. This was my focus, but this is their focus. All right? So you don't have to push your values into them, but find out what their values are and piggyback on those values. All right? So because of this, improve security and livelihood and led to this. Do I still have more time? How much time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll tell a story later on. I'll focus on the 
lesson learned and conclusion from these three stories. Okay, this is very brief. So, one, emphasizing what we've been talking for the last one and a half days through the different talks on tourism, on community participation in protected areas. We're talking about, we say we don't have human resources. The human resources are there. Okay, there are some protected areas with no people, fine. That's easy, but there's people here. We can't get rid of them. Those are traditional protected areas, getting rid of them. Myanmar removed one million people. WCS, by the way, did that. Got the Burmese government to remove one million people to declare a protected area. All right, don't think the NGOs do not have any blemishes. All right, participation, engagement. We are talking about informed participation, not just participation, informed participation. Managing the resources for their use. If they can see what they benefit, they are willing to compromise. Okay, I will not do this because I get this. All right? Give them the opportunities, opportunities to learn about how their presence, their activities impact the ecosystem that impact them. They can think. They're not dumb. They're smarter than us. All right? A big problem that we face. Consultants do not listen. We are consultants. We are paid $1,000 to $1,005, $500, not ringgit, US dollars per day to give advice. But we can't give advice if we don't learn how to listen. This is one of the biggest problems. Find out what the needs as opposed to the wants. All right? And not what you think they need, what they really need. And But that doesn't mean that you have to comply to their needs. You're the one who have to think what is correct, what is not correct. This is where you join with science. So I think I got time for some, the short story. So why did they do it? In Laos, as opposed to the textbooks, this, their source of protein is fish and frogs. All the textbooks say wild meat. It is true in other parts of Southeast Asia, in Africa or elsewhere, South America. But for Laos, main source of protein, protein is fish and frog. So what did I do? Just sit down, have a chat, have a meal. So, what are your problems now? Well, we, we don't have, we, we have problem with fish. How far do you have to go for fish now? Oh, you know that place, that intersection is about 10 kilometers away. Mm, okay. How, do you get a lot of fish? No, some, a few small fish. What about 10 years ago? Oh, not too far. We hike about 5 kilometers away. You know, we got the fish. What about when you were 10 years old? Ah, teacher. Just in front of our house, we have plenty of fish. Okay. Uh, how would you like to get your fish back? Ah, impossible. I said, how would you like to get your fish back? He said, they would love that. Okay, I get you your fish back. You do conservation work for me. And I said, try it for five years. Try it for five years. Actually, I, I didn't have that confidence, but I spoke as if I had confidence. <laughs> try it for five years. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, eat every tiger inside. <laughs> and I do not know how. Three months later, the fish came back. The fish came back in three months. And it was basic, simple rule and regulation. What you can fish, when you can fish, what implement you can fish, who can fish in which area. Season, just basic things. But there was side effect. Within three months, when I came back to the village again, there was six jars about this size of tapai. So after hiking for a whole day, reached the village, I was dead drunk for two days. <laughs> All right, that's the side effect. So basically, innovation. Innovation in our thinking. Not just creative thinking, but put it, try it. You're at, you're at, the, you're at the ground level. Do it. All right? So, terima kasih and hope you all success. Thank you.